So the next part here is to look at predictions. So what we have, we have observations up to time t. That means we also have the previous observation, t minus 1, t minus 2, and t minus 3, and so forth. What we typically want to do is to make a prediction of yt plus k, where k is a number greater than or equal to 1. Now, if we want to minimize the expected square error, then the optimal prediction is the conditional expectation, as been said before. So y hat t plus k given t equals the expectation of y t plus k conditioning on, on all the previous observation, all the known observation up to time now. So to give an example of that, if you have a pure AR1 model, we can write it in the following form, yt plus 1 equals phi yt plus epsilon t plus 1. Now, what we have to do is to do the conditional expectation. So y, to make a one-step prediction, yt plus 1 given t hat is the expectation of yt plus 1 given yt and so forth backwards. Now, one way of doing this is to say, well, what do we know about yt plus 1? It's effectively phi yt plus epsilon t plus 1. That's just plugging in the definition from the model up here. And now we have a conditional expectation here. The expectation is a linear operator, so we can apply it in parts. And if we apply it for the first bit here, the expectation of yt, uh, expectation of phi yt, given yt, that's just phi yt. And the expectation of epsilon t plus 1, that's a future epsilon. So it's unknown, so that's zero. So we get the expectation is phi yt. Now if we go for the two-step prediction, we pretty much do the same thing. We insert the what the yt plus 2 is, basically the same thing as up here, except that t is now plus 1 everywhere. Now yt plus 1, we know what that is, so we can plug, we can look at what we have here. So it's the expectation of this plus the expectation of that. Again, the expectation of epsilon t plus 2 is 0, so we're left with phi times the expectation of yt plus 1 given t, which we got just up here. So we end up having phi squared yt. And I think you can easily follow me to say, well, if we just continue doing this, what we get is the k-step prediction is phi to the k power yt. And then we just have to keep on going there. Now, as an example of that, what we have, we have observed some data, and then at some point we want to make a prediction. And we see that the prediction goes towards zero, as that's the mean value of the particular process. Again, we could have chosen a different value, but for simplicity, we just go for zero. This is a case where phi is 0.8, and we get something here, and then we get 0.8 times that, 0.64, point and so forth, all the way down. So this is a prediction. Now, one thing I've said repeatedly is that it's good to have predictions, but you need to know something about the uncertainty. Otherwise, you don't know actually what you know. So we need to look at the variance of the prediction error. Now, for the AR1 model, what we're looking at is then the error at, of time t plus k given t. Well, that's the true value at y t plus k minus the predicted or expected value. Now, the expected value is easy because that's just phi to the k power y t. And then we have it. Now, if we take y t plus k and expand that to figure out what does it actually contain. We've if you just take it step by step to go backwards, we want to get back to y t and some epsilon. Then to go one step backward, we have just setting in the definition of the function phi y t plus k minus 1 plus epsilon t plus k. That was the first step. Now we take this 
y and c plus k minus 1, and expand that to get what is inside the parentheses here. This gives us an epsilon t plus k minus 1, and it gives a, a phi y t plus k minus 2. So we just step time backwards, one step at a time. Each time we do an expansion, we will take this one here, multiply in the phi here to get to the next line. Then we'll take the y t plus k minus 2 and expand that the same way as we did from here to there. We go from here to there. And we can continue that operation. And what we'll get is phi to increasing power. And then multiplying on y t plus k minus 3 plus 1 power down. And then what you'll see that the power of phi here is the same number of steps that you go backward in time, all the way back down here. So that's the structure. So the information, the further back in time you go with the epsilons, the less the weight on those. And what you want to do is you want to get back to phi, t, phi, phi to the k power on yt. So you want to get back to yt. That gives us a phi to the k power here, plus phi to the k minus 1 power on epsilon t plus 1, and then comes all the weights down, all to just epsilon t plus k down here at the end. So this is what we have. For y t plus k can be written on this form. Yes, it's long, but the nice thing is when we subtract this term here, we are left with just a lot of epsilons. So what we have is essentially all these epsilons with powers of phi's as weights. And we know that all these epsilons are independently, identically distributed. So what the variance is, well, we have a variance of a constant on a stochastic random variable here, plus some things that are independent. So we can look at the variance of each term on its own. And the variance of epsilon t plus 1 is just sigma square. And then we have phi to the k minus 1 power, which gives us a phi to the 2 times k minus 1 power when you go outside. And then you have a phi to the 2 times k minus 2 power all the way down to a 1, all multiplied by sigma epsilon square. So as we looked at in the other cases, the prediction interval for this becomes the predicted value plus minus an appropriate quantile in the standard normal distribution where everything are known, and then multiply it by the standard deviation of the prediction error. So that's basically what we have to do. Now, that was in a simple AR model. If you want to do it in an AMA model, it's pretty much the same that we're doing. For now, again, without laws of generality, we just assume that k is greater than the maximum order of the AR and the MA terms. So what we can do is we can write the process. We want to predict time k. So we'll just write the process how it looks like at time t plus k. So we have y t plus k plus phi 1, y t plus k minus 1, plus, and then all the way down to phi p, y t plus k minus p. So that was the autoregressive part, and then that equals the moving average part, epsilon t plus k plus theta 1, epsilon t plus k minus 1, plus all the way down to theta q, epsilon t plus k minus q. Now, what we want to do is use conditional expectation. We do it on both sides. But essentially, what we do is that we take those terms here and move it on the other side, changing the sign, and keep the moving average part. And then we just do the conditional expectation on conditioning on time t. So what do we know at time t about all these different variables? Now, let's start with the easy ones. All these epsilons, since k is greater than q, that was the assumption we did up here, then we, these epsilons, all these epsilons, 
are in the future. So the expectation of those, they are all zero. But in order to go here, what we need to do is to do this recursively because we need to do something about all the y's up there. But first of all, as long as k is greater than q, the expectation is zero. Now, we can take the entire process and write it on, well, at least if it is invertible, we can write it with pi weights like this. If this process goes sufficiently fast to zero, that's one of those weak terms, then we can solve this and find the epsilons using only a small number of y's of the previous observations. So if we want to look at the variance of a prediction error, if we have the pi weights for the process, then, well, the case of prediction is the following. Yt plus k given t is just all those weights that you have on the epsilons that are known. Nothing about the future epsilons. So this is zero. But then the error is all about knowing what happens here. What happened from epsilon t plus 1 up to epsilon t plus k. And thus the variance, if we have it on this form, can be written as the k-step prediction variance is parenthesis 1 plus psi, actually the sum of all this psi squared, times sigma 2 epsilon. Notice that it goes to k minus 1, because we start off with a 1 up here. Now, as an example, we have a model up here that is, you can say, is autoversive, including integration here, so it's an AR2 part here, then we have a lowercase d of 1, and then there's no moving average part. So this is an Arriva model of order 2, 1, 0. Sometimes you call it just an Ari, neglecting the moving average model. We have a mean value in this case, and we have some data that we observed, and we want to do a prediction. So we have the price for the last six days in this case, and we are asked to do the prediction two days ahead. So the first thing to do is to take the model and to multiply out the two polynomials to say, well, now we have it as a pure set of pi weights, as in weights on previous observations, and then we can write, well, what is the expectation of, or the additional expectation of the next observation? That's fairly easy. We just take what we have up here and plug in. And in this case, we know all the previous observations. It depends on yt, yt minus 1, and yt minus 2. Now, when you make, want to make the two-step prediction, it depends on the one-step prediction and the known values, but we can calculate those. Now, when we get to the error part of things here, in the first one-step prediction here, the only error that is there is from the epsilon t plus 1. Now, when we look at the two-step prediction error, then we have to take care of epsilon t plus 2, but we also have to take care of the uncertainty that is on the one-step prediction error that goes into the conditional expectation there. So we get epsilon, the variance of epsilon t plus 2 plus 1 minus phi 1, which is the multiplier here, on epsilon t plus 1, that we had an uncertainty from up here. So basically what we have to do here is just to calculate this, and we get 0 .9, uh, 4 .0 0.499 to go back, the process as itself has a standard deviation of 0.2, and now for two-step prediction error, the standard error is about 
two and a half times that. And then we get a 95% prediction interval ranging from 86 to 88, around the 87. So that's how we do things. When one make prediction in complex model, you do that recursively stepping one step forward in time at a time. So all combined, what have we covered in this small sequence of costs here? We have lo looked at stochastic processes. In particular, we discussed stationarity, both strong stationarity and weak stationarity. And then we looked at autocovariance first in general, but more specifically, we also discussed when we have a stationary process, it only depends on the time difference. And then we kind of made a transition through an infinite number of parameters that we cannot estimate, given a finite sample of observations. We defined some classes of models, namely the moving average, autoregressive, and the autoregressive moving average processes. We also went for their non-stationarity and seasonal uh, expansions the arena models, both ordinary and seasonal models. And then we kind of restated that the optimal prediction is the conditional expectation. And that was all for now. Take care. <laughs>